I said to my dad, gosh, how am I going to keep doing this? This is like torture. (laughs) And he said, start inviting your clients out to lunch. It'll change the relationship. And when I started getting to know people, I started having a good time and making more placements. Welcome to the Resilient Recruiter Podcast. This is your host, Mark Whitby. I'm joined today by Jody Kulik Mayer. Jody Kulik Mayer is the founder and president of Claremont Technologies, Inc., a WBENC certified women's business enterprise. As an IT staffing veteran since 1992, Jody has placed hundreds of IT people, both as employees and consultants, at companies in the financial, consumer product, nonprofit, and e-commerce industries. Many of Jody's clients have worked with her since the beginning of her career. In fact, many have been candidates she, she placed who later became clients. Jody is also the host of Tech Talent Today, a podcast providing fresh ideas and inspiration for IT professionals to help them propel their career in tech to the next level. Jody, welcome. Thank you so much for being here. Hi, Mark. Thanks so much for having me. My pleasure. I am looking forward to this. So, Jody, I know you've been in IT staffing for a long, long time, and you've been extremely successful at it. I understand that you've grown your account to 80 IT consultants on billing at a staffing firm, which uh, is quite mind-boggling. Could you talk me through how you accomplished that? Sure, Mark. Uh, I am very proud of it, but it was a long time coming. It wasn't in like the first years of my career. It came about at, I think it's the third company that I worked at. And I was watching to see the other uh, people who had a lot of consultants on billing. How did they do it? And they would have one main account where they could have 50 or 60 consultants which is both good and bad because then if that count goes away, your business is wiped in a second. Um, So I saw there was one of the clients that had, um, they kept their consultants a really long time. It was a consumer products firm uh, in Long Island. And I said, I'm gonna concentrate my time there. And they just happened to be doing a, a vendors list review. So I said, I'm going to try to get on the vendors list. So some of it was good timing. You know, we uh, pitched to get on the vendors list. They, they liked us. They liked that we were a Japanese owned company. They were also a Japanese company and we got on the list. And then I pretty much moved in there. I was there (laughs) uh, once a week getting to know everybody. I came a part of the landscape. And that was probably the key to getting the consultants on billing there. So I probably had about 60 on there and then 20 at other places. Great. So thanks for sharing that. Really interesting. Let me back up then a second. So I should have probably asked you a little bit about your career in the first place. So this was, you'd already been an experienced recruiter for a while. It's not like you were an overnight success. But um, so you knew what you were doing and this was your third company where you were able to build that number of IT consultants on billing. Um, In terms of, first of all, you identified the company that you thought was a good prospect and one of your criteria was they seem to keep people a long time, which is interesting. Could you say more about that? Right. I think that's harder these days because um in the united states you know the irs is very interested in who is a consultant versus who is an employee so some uh companies don't want to keep their consultants a long time they have like 18 months uh tenure that where somebody has to at least i think be out for six months or a year but at that time that wasn't an issue and some companies still don't follow that And that's a good place because otherwise you just have a lot of churn where you're placing people, but you're not growing. Okay. So Jody, uh, yeah, totally. We have the same situation in the UK. There's uh, legislation called IR35, which essentially is the the government wanting to, um, you know, 
charge as much tax as possible and look at people who are self-employed consultants and questionable, are they really, or are they employees? Um, and so on. So I think that's, that's the same everywhere. Um, we actually, before we dive deeper onto how you built this account, maybe just take a step back and talk about why do you like, why do you prefer placing consultants or contractors as, as I would call them, rather than permanent direct hire employees? Well, there's two reasons that I prefer consultants. Uh, I always say it's like dating versus getting married, right? Uh -huh. It's much easier to just say yes to a date than to say we're going to get married now. So the whole consulting process can be very fast. Like within a week or two, the person can be working. So I did like the, the quickness and, um, of the whole process. And uh, I also like the um, recurring revenue. Right? So when you build a stable of people, every month you have money coming in. So when times are tough, you still have that stable of people. Absolutely. Really, that's a good explanation. Thank you for sharing that. I am surprised more recruiters don't really um, investigate the opportunity to have temps, consultants, interims, some form of... Um, you know, of temporary uh, workers as part of their business for the reasons that you just shared. I think that um, it's it can be a tremendous advantage. So coming back to your story, you identified this company. Were they an existing client of the business that you were working for or how did you come across them? They were an existing client but there was no salesperson assigned to them. So they were sort of languishing. So, Great. so there was a couple of people who worked there, which just gave me a point to start, start talking to people, learning about the account and mm -hmm. figuring out my plan of attack. Okay, excellent. So then you learned that they were reviewing their vendor list and you, you pitched and were successful. Like what did that process involve in terms of pitching to win this piece of business? That was very nerve wracking and also a funny story, which uh, proves that relationships are number one. Um, so we had to make a, an, an in-person presentation of how we're gonna support the account. And since it was a Japanese company, several of the senior managers were Japanese from Japan. So you always had to make sure that you didn't make a faux pas, like putting their business card in your back pocket or um, saying nice to meet you when you've already met them once, uh, because that's an insult. That means you forgot them. So you have the pressure of making the presentation plus keeping um, cultural uh, norms in mind for them. But I'm a very detailed person, so I'm bringing a lot of stuff with me because I'm, I'm leading the group. I have my manager there. The president of the company is with me. So I'm bringing like snacks and I'm bringing <laughs> papers and I'm bringing also the, um, the assistance to a lot of the senior managers were working with me to get ready. So I brought separate food for them. I wanted them to have their own food. And thank God that I did that because I realized when I got there, I had all this stuff and I forgot my laptop with the presentation. <gasps> oh my God, I'll never forget it. <laughs> and right, I'm with my manager, I'm with the president of the company. I'm thinking, oh my God, I forgot my laptop. So I told one of the assistants, oh my God, I forgot my laptop. But this is after I have like food for them and everything and I've developed a relationship with them. They got me a laptop. We got an internet connection. They didn't tell anyone. Nobody knew. <laughs> so Wow. So yeah. major panic. And then, oh my God. Mm, fantastic. And so yeah. you're, you were able to access your, pre your, your pre uh, presentation. Even right, over the internet. Someone else's. Wow, that's lucky. Yeah. Oh my and, goodness. Uh, <laughs> so... Talk to me about how you prepared for the presentation, though, because, you know, I've seen and and a lot of these types of pitches and 
a lot of them just seem really boring to me, Jody, and not and and kind of like just going on and on about their company and their history and their capabilities and so on. What did you do that you think helped you to clinch the deal? Well, first I wrote up the presentation and showed it to my contact there. And I said, Great. give me feedback on what we're gonna talk about. Are there any questions that are missing? Um, right, is anything extraneous? So that was really key in figuring out like what to put in the presentation I, I still think they're boring, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> it's what they were interested in hearing. So we did that and then we tweaked the presentation. And then I brainstormed with my manager, what are all the questions we don't want to be asked and think of answers to them so you're not caught short. Um, I can't remember if they asked any of them, but we were very well prepared for it. Awesome. Um, I think at this point also they were partial to us. So as long as we didn't blow it, they were gonna put us on the list because the whole time we're developing the relationships. So it wasn't just cold, we're making a presentation and they don't know us. Great, great tips there. So you'd done obviously a huge amount of preparation, but also got feedback from your contacts there to make sure that you were on track and that the information you were sharing was the most relevant, what they needed to hear and so on. Um, I love your idea of preparing for the worst, most awkward or difficult questions that you they might ask you. That's brilliant. So then you were successful, but were you one of a number of vendors that were approved or were you the only one? We were one of four vendors that were approved. One of four. Okay. And then how, in terms of the pie then of total of number of, you know, IT consultants they were hiring, what percentage do you think you, you know, were, were working through you? Um, I guess almost half i think they had about 200 consultants and yeah. so i don't remember exactly how many we had on at the time Great. 60 65 it changed over time but we had a pretty decent portion of the pie great awesome so you mentioned that you moved in there and became part of the furniture like what could you describe what that involved i would go uh, once a week and meet with the vendor manager. And when you meet once a week, there's not like so much business to talk about every week. So we became friends and we're still friends to this day. Um, oh, you know, cool. He's been at several clients, yes. And it, it's really wonderful. I think that's the best part of the business, the relationships and the friendships that often outlast the business relationship. Wow, that's awesome. So, um, so you, you we're doing these weekly reviews with them, which, you know, turned into also relationship building and, and be, you know, you got to know people personally. Um, what else do you think allowed you to be, to over perform there and, and get, you know, 60 people in one account? Um, we would have a monthly lunch at the client where all your consultants were supposed to come, but I would invite everybody. If people were passing by, the security guard, who, whoever was there, you know, I wanted to feed everyone. <laughs> and it was a good time. It made the account like a really friendly place. So everybody would wanna come by and get a plate of food and say hello. And they would always have some business to talk about. So you would learn a lot there. Plus your consultants are the eyes and ears for you at the account. So uh, they, they would let you know what was coming up as well, or maybe things that were happening behind the scenes. So you really got a lot of intelligence. Beautiful, absolutely. That makes a lot of sense. And you're, and a lot of companies focus on client, well, not since COVID, but client entertainment, right? For your big accounts and taking them out to lunch or to events or whatever, but, you're inviting your consultants along to that because if anything, they're a really important part of this equation too, right? So sounds like you're um, making sure to look after them at the same time. Any other keys to success, Jody? I think also um, the relationship is very key for solving problems because with people, mm. there are always problems that right. come up and trying to come up with 
like innovative solutions or just trying different things. So I, I think you're more successful solving problems when you have those base relationships and always being honest, like think about what's best for the situation, not what's best for you as a salesperson. Mm, absolutely. Great, great point. Jody. how much, if you don't mind me asking, how much did that account end up being worth? I think it was about uh, 16 million in revenue. Wow. Per year. Per year. Yes. Yeah. Wow. That's amazing. Um, now you also mentioned that you didn't have all your eggs in one basket because you could see the risk of doing that. So you made sure to have consultants billing with other clients as well. Do you know how many kind of uh, different accounts you had in total? I probably had about three or four more, but mm -hmm. some of them were like onesies, twosies, or yep. five people in the account. It's yeah. really hard to have that many people on billing. I mean, I had a team supporting me. You know, we had a consultant liaison, which is very important because 80 people have a lot of problems <laughs> <laughs> and right. need to be solved. And that needs to run smoothly. And of course, my recruiting team. So I certainly did not do this by myself. I had a, a great team supporting me. Great. So to run an account that size, how many people do you really need? I think a consulting liaison, a mm -hmm. strong accounting department. Yes. And um, two or three recruiters. Yeah. The client has like, similar needs that come out all the time. So you get really good yeah. at what they're looking for. Got it. Got it. So you weren't necessarily recruiting or filling those jobs. You were managing the account and you had a, your team of recruiters who would fill the jobs. That's right. They would find the candidates. Yeah. Um, I would check the, the job specs. And also I speak to everybody to make sure that I think it fits the need for the client. Got it. Okay. Absolutely. Before I go to my next question, I'd like to share one of the keys to my success in recruitment and in business. You may have noticed that a lot of the people I interview on this show have a coach. That's not a coincidence. Most high achievers have a coach, including me. I've worked with various coaches over the last 20 years, and it's been a huge factor in my own personal and business growth. Here's why. Sometimes it's hard to see the forest for the trees, and it really helps to take a step back and look at how you can improve the business and get a fresh outside perspective from someone who's bringing new ideas and insights to the table. Plus, as a business owner, who is holding you accountable and helping you stay on track? So I want to encourage you, if you're not already working with a coach, get one. It doesn't have to be me. There are plenty of amazing coaches out there. Just find someone who you believe will add measurable value to your business and can help you get to the next level. If you do want to explore a coaching relationship with me, then you're welcome to apply for a free 30-minute strategy session at recruitmentcoach.com forward slash breakthrough. This is not a sales call. My number one objective is to help you to get clear on your goals, identify the roadblocks that are holding you back, and create a strategic plan to increase your billings and grow your business. I promise you'll leave our session feeling focused, re-energized, and excited to take your business to the next level. You can apply at www.recruitmentcoach.com forward slash breakthrough. So you built up this fantastic uh, account. So you had 16 million in revenue from one company, plus you had three or four other clients. Um, what, you know, it sounds like you were so successful there. Why did you decide to leave and step your own IT staffing firm? It was really difficult because it is so hard to build that, um, that you don't want to leave it and you love your team and it's, you know, churning along, but companies are always changing and, um, I, I got a new manager that was not a match for me, and I was becoming, you know, increasingly unhappy. Uh, I actually had a medical incident, I don't know what else to call it, where I had to call an ambulance, and I was in the hospital for several days, um, and thankfully they couldn't find anything wrong with me, but I, when I thought about it, I think... It was stress and my body telling me how unhappy I was. And that was when I started thinking about starting my own business. Because the thought of building again for another company where things can keep changing, 
um, I, I didn't want to do that again. I said, I'm going to do it for myself the next time. Oh my gosh, Jody. So first of all, I'm sorry that you had that health um, or, you know, medical emergency. And, and and I suspect during the pandemic, quite a few people with, high, you know, have experienced like higher stress levels and more uh, medical, you know, situations as a result. Um Looking at the silver lining, it sounds like that maybe gave you the wake up call or the impetus to really break out of the golden handcuffs that you were, you know, you had with that company and, and do your own thing. So, you know, it, 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 uh, that crisis maybe led to something positive for you. Definitely. And I really appreciated my husband's support <laughs> because he always told me, um, you should open your own business. And I thought, no, I'm just going along and having a grand time at my you know, current company. And so we moved to the suburbs, we get a house, I have a baby, the baby is two. And I said, okay, I'm going in my own business. He said, you couldn't have done this before. We had all these things happening, but he was on board. He's been really supportive and always a cheerleader uh, for me, which I appreciate. Fantastic. Yeah. Do you know what, though, there's never a right time or a best time. You know, you could always say, oh, well, you know, we have a new baby or we've just bought a house or oh, the economy is you know, not as good or whatever the reason there's, you know, there's, there's never a perfect timing. So I'm glad that you made that. And how long ago was that, Jody? Eight years ago. Okay, great. Well, congratulations on eight years Thank you. in business, which is much longer than most businesses survive, unfortunately. Um, and especially with everything we've been through. Um, this is a burnout business, or, or it can be. Um, you've done it for 29 years. Um, how do you think you've been able to have that longevity? I think the key thing is definitely the relationships with people. Because I remember when I started in 1992, my boss at the time gave me Computer World. He said like, read Computer World and learn about it. That was the training, <laughs> Computer <laughs> World and a, a, a chart with technology on it. That said like mainframe, client, server. And I would have to ask my questions based on that chart. So if something was not on the chart, I was like, panicked. <laughs> I didn't know what to ask. <laughs> Hilarious. Um, yeah. But um, I said to my dad, I said, gosh, how am I going to keep doing this? This is like torture. <laughs> and he said, start inviting your clients out to lunch. It, it'll change the relationship. And when I started getting to know people, I started having a good time and making more placements. That was good advice. Uh, yeah. Absolutely. Like... Remember, this is a relationship business ultimately, and it's easy to get caught up in, you know, the numbers, the targets, the, you know, the the metrics, and you know, asking the right questions. These are all important things, but ultimately, um, it's the relationships, the human element that makes it interesting, challenging, and 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 rewarding. Um, I should have probably started by asking you about like how did you get started in this business? So, 1992, you said. Right. So, I shouldn't even admit uh, that. <laughs> ah, no, that's great. Absolutely. You have um, so much experience. I started in 1997. Uh, so you had a head start on me. And why did you get into staffing? I just fell into it by accident. Mm. I graduated from Same. college. Yeah, it was a recession. I interviewed for all different types of jobs. And... Um, this one, uh, it seemed it was a, you know, I joined a, a growing company at the time um, with a, a lot of young people in it. So it seemed fun and interesting. And I thought I'd give it a shot. And I never thought like I'd be a recruiter or anything like that, but by accident. And here you are 29 years later. So wh what was the job like, you know, then versus now, Jody? Wow. Yeah, it was really different. We used to um, fax resumes. 
Yeah. Or, <laughs> and sometimes we'd hear stories that our competitors would steal resumes off the fax when they were at the <laughs> client sites. <laughs> Hilarious. So, yeah, you had to call people. Um, we had a beeper, right? There's no closing deals on the run with your phone. Like now you could work anywhere when you're on vacation. Um, you'd be out, your beeper would go, you'd have to find a pay phone. <laughs> <laughs> I sound like a hundred years old. <laughs> yeah, it was very different. Yeah. So hilarious. So your beeper goes, I had a beeper as well, not in recruiting, in a different job. Yeah. And then you, yeah, you have to pull the car over, go to a pay phone, call the office, what, find out what, you know, what's going on. Hilarious. Um, if you don't know what a beeper is, Google it. And uh, <laughs> probably some people don't even know what we're talking about right now. So that's right. funny. Okay. So um what else, like, how did you know, when and how did you know that this was the right job for you? You know, when you start making placements and yeah. you have the relationships, you're just enjoying your day to day. I mean, there's yeah. always problems to be solved, but I, I like solving problems. I, I enjoy it and it's something I'm good at. Um, so I, I think just the, the people and I, I did like... Um, it's very remunerative, so it gives you a lot of freedom. You can save money. It gives you choices, and I, I like to have that. It makes me feel secure. Awesome. Yeah, it makes I'm sure that will resonate for, for many people. So then let's fast forward to today, and you've recently launched a podcast. How is that going? Well, why did you decide to do that, first of all? Well, um, with the pandemic... I was feeling like I was getting stale. And one of my problems is that since it is such a relationship business, now my means for going to meet people in person uh, no longer existed. So I was looking for a solution to those problems. And I found your podcast and started listening to it and loved it. I thought it was inspiring. It gave me new ideas. So I looked into your group and joined it which has been wonderful. And your group inspired me to start my podcast because I wanted to um, find a way to inspire and give fresh ideas to the IT community, just like your podcast did that for me. Oh, amazing. Thank you so much, Jody, for, for sharing that. I'm so glad that we found each other then and that the podcast, um, you know, brought you to me. And, and that's the powerful thing, I think, about um, trying to, for whatever market you serve, trying to be that uh, leader and share, you know, ideas and build a community that helps people. And I feel like anybody listening could do that. It doesn't have to be a podcast. It, you know, it could be something else. It could be doing webinars or hosting roundtable meetings for your, you know, your niche or, you know, uh, producing videos on LinkedIn. You know, there's a number of different strategies, but being visible and, and um, assuming a leadership role in your ecosystem and sharing ideas and, and valuable insights i think it, it um it without any immediate benefit to yourself i think it does attract people and helps you to um you know it builds your credibility in your market but also the like how many episodes have you done so far jody i've uh, done two we Great. launched our first one um juliet samson She's a, a CIO and such an interesting and inspiring lady that even though I knew her beforehand, I didn't know everything about her. And I, she is resilient and smart and has a lot of wisdom. So I had a blast making that with her and I hope people really enjoy it. Amazing. I, you, I think that you're absolutely right. It's a, like what we're doing right now, this is fun, right? We just get to have an interesting conversation and, and learn from each other. And so even if it wasn't commercially beneficial, I would do it just for that reason. In fact, I was already, like I've been having these sorts of conversations for my whole career, um, you know, so for almost 20 years now. And it's one of, I believe the keys to my success is, you know, 
interviewing and asking, you know, finding smart, successful people and asking them for some time and asking questions to try and uncover what is it that like, what is their secret to success or what are they doing that I could, I could emulate or what could, ha, what could I learn from that person? And I've, I've always done that. And the podcast is just a way of me recording those conversations and then sharing them to benefit more people. Um, but I really believe in the, the power of having a mentor and of modeling successful people really. So you're my mentor as well, Jody, um, in that, in that way. So I appreciate you. Um, We'll link to your podcast in the show notes so people can see what, what you're doing as well. Um, what else does the future hold for Claremont Technologies? Well, we're going to continue uh, pu putting out our podcast. Our second one comes out on uh, August 19th, which uh, is with Art Fid, and he is a CIO at uh, reedsjewelers.com. And he has a great philosophy. He's done a lot of digital transformation, but the core of his success is um, the culture of the company, working on the people and the relationships, and that drives the digital transformation. And it was fascinating to hear how um, he's been so successful. So I hope that will inspire other people. Yeah, amazing. You're you're. You're on a roll, so I'm I'm really excited for you, Jody. So, um, if you had a a business owner coming to you, or someone who's thinking about starting a recruitment business um, or staffing business, and they wanted your advice, looking back over eight years of success, what would you say? What would you tell them? What would be like your top two or three things that you think are required to be successful in this business? I think for sure, n number one is relationships. Um, I guess what's challenging when you first start a business, a lot of times you have a non-compete. So the people you have the closest relationships with, you can't work with them for a year. You have to you know, wait, wait it out. But um, if you have a very broad network, uh, you'll be able to grow your business there. And I think the quickest way to grow it is with people you know. Because uh, a lot of times my consultants introduced me into accounts. It's like a person vouching for you. And that was the quickest way in where you're not filling out a formal RFP. Awesome. So can you say a little more about that? Is that something that you specifically encourage or you have a, a technique for? Like, how do, you, how do you get those referrals from your consultants? Well, uh, when I would speak to people about you know what I was doing, starting my business, a lot of times they, they volunteered it. So I guess because I've given help in the past, right? Mm -hmm. They say, right, dig your well before you're thirsty. What is that, Harvey McKay? <laughs> so, yeah, that's a good book. Um, is that, I think that's from Swim of the Sharks Without Being Eaten Alive or something like that. Is that yes, the guy yeah. we're talking about? Yeah. Yes, yeah, loved that book. And the McKay 66 to know like 66 facts about your network. Um, I'm naturally that way and I, I love to help people. So when I was starting my business and just telling people about it, they would suggest things to me or make introductions for me, um, which for me made it more comfortable than asking. Amazing. So let me break this down a little bit because I think actually it's, um, it's really smart. So first of all, you approach people who already knew you to just tell them what you're doing and, and um, let them know that you're starting a business. And because you'd helped them in the past, they automatically, and you, know, you had that relationship, they wanted to help you. That's right. Yeah. It was very gratifying and humbling. And it's scary when you go out there on your own. So it's good to have friends. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, um, Jody, what would you say has been the biggest challenge or um, roadblock you've had to overcome in terms of building your own rec recruiting and staffing firm? I think 
delegating has been very difficult for me. One of my greatest strengths is actually maybe a weakness when you have a business. I am a workhorse who can coordinate tons of details. Um, I, I hardly ever get tired. I can work a lot. So I take things on that I should probably delegate to somebody else. And I, I think that impedes growth. So I think that's really important. Absolutely. That's a great point. And a lot of people I'm sure can relate to that. And it can be hard to let go of things or to, you know, sometimes think, well, nobody's going to do as good a job of this as, as I will. Or the other barriers people think, well, by the time I explain what's involved right. and get someone trained so they can do it, then I, it would just be easier if I just did it myself. So how did you get over that kind of wanting to, you know, retain control of everything? It's still a work in progress and I still okay. struggle with that, but um, it gets to a point in your own business where you can't do it. You're starting to make mistakes. So it's better if you give it out um, to somebody else to do it because it's not core to helping you grow. And so when I would have that realization, I, I would give it out and people have been doing a great job. I just, I, I should not have been so resistant to that. Um, also, a tip that I got from you, which has been very successful, is recording uh, Loom videos of what you want done, and then you've explained it, and a person can go back to it without asking you again. So that was a great tip from you. All right. Amazing. Do you have a criteria for what sort of tasks, activities you still want to do personally versus what you think would be appropriate for somebody else to delegate to, to somebody else? Well, I still love the business. So I love to talk to clients and get the requirements and work with my recruiting team and still speak to all the candidates. So that is very core because the whole thing is to place the right people in the positions, but any kind of coordination or social media or accounting, that should be delegated to somebody else. Makes total sense. You're playing to your strengths, doing the parts that you enjoy and you're good at and which are core to, you know, generating revenue. And uh, so it makes, makes total sense, Jody. Listen, I've really enjoyed our conversation today. Thank you so much again for agreeing to do this. It was a great time, Mark. Thanks so much for having me. And uh, so listen, I'm a fan of your podcast now, so I'll look forward to the next episode coming out. And um, yeah, let's, let's touch base again soon and compare notes as to, you know, tips for being successful as a podcaster. That sounds great. Thanks, Mark. Thank you so much for listening to The Resilient Recruiter. If you've enjoyed the show, the best way you can show your support is to click that subscribe button. Thanks again, and I'll see you next time.